the whistle, Jay. You want to blow the whistle? Are yeah. You ready to do a Casey Jones? Better than I can. Iowa to see Big Boy, the world's most powerful steam engine. Look at the size of this thing. Uh, and thanks to Union Pacific and Ed Dickens, he's in charge of this whole deal. So tell us what we got here. Well, you're looking at 1941 technology. This particular locomotive was built in November of 41. 600 tons, 7,000 horsepower. It's one of 25 built, the only one operating in the world today. And people don't realize how big a role trains played in building the United States. I mean, prior to trains, it took months and months to cross the United States by horse and wagon. When trains came in, you could do it in a matter of weeks. In fact, Abraham Lincoln came here to Council Bluffs, didn't he? He to did. To kind of inaugurate this line. Isn't that correct? The driving of the Golden Spike began right here in Council Bluffs, Iowa, with, with, General, uh, with General Dodge and Abraham Lincoln not far from here. Yeah. And as they began to build the railroad and establish all the different relationships, the National Park Service was actually created with with uh, the ability to take all of the passengers into the national parks. Railroading was the best way to get there, designed and built by Union Pacific architects and engineers. And to this day, with the National Parks Foundation, there's opportunities for millions of kids to be exposed to this technology and all the fascinating technology that that provides yeah. them. And you can still do it today. I mean, trains, you know, we don't hear about the role trains play in America, but it really is pretty amazing, isn't it? How much tonnage is moved way more than trucking, isn't it? Well, if you think about it, I mean, look at the gravel, and right. look at everything, and all the stuff in our lives, it's kind of operating in the background, but the clothes on our back, the glasses, the plastic, the rubber, our shoes, our jeans, our fabric, every aspect, all the building materials in your houses, I mean, the, the list is endless. If you look at the average train, I mean, imagine the commodities in there, all the chemicals and the petrochemicals and all the raw materials, all the finished product. I mean, just clickety-clack, just slamming down that freeway 24-7. Yeah, and the fun thing is, now rich people have fancy cars. Back then, they had fancy rail cars. Yeah. And they would hook up to a Union Pacific. You would bring your rail car, if you're a J.P. Morgan or somebody, you have it built, you could hook on to Union Pacific, pay whatever it is, and just drive across the United States. So, <laughs> fantastic, fantastic, pretty cool. Well, let's take a little closer look here. Now, you see, I love it when American corporations are proud of their heritage. And obviously, you do something like rebuilding this for love, because this, this is not a profit generating thing. These things were built when technology was expensive and labor was cheap. Now, it's the other way around, isn't it? It's completely opposite. It's pretty simple technology, but it's incredibly robust and incredibly strong. Tell us a little bit of the history. Well, it was built to do the same thing we do today. This is the steam locomotive equivalent of what we have operating today. It looks older, but from an efficiency standpoint, this is state-of-the-art 1940s. Designed and built specifically to move a lot of tonnage and to solve complex transportation issues that the railroad needed to solve, and Big Boy did it. You know, steam really ran America from the early 1800s well into the 1900s, and the internal combustion came in, and then trucking, and then steam gradually. This is the last days of steam. This is probably one of the very last steam vehicles produced in America, isn't it? This technology does represent that. The Union Pacific bought, we still run the last locomotive we bought, the UP 844. But this class of locomotives, there were 25 ultimately built, designed in the late 1930s. This one was built in November of 41. But it does represent the last gasp of right, steam. Right. And they ran for 17 years. Yeah. And the nice thing about steam is it'll pretty much run forever. You know, I've got some steam vehicles I enjoy. You can leave them sit for 25 years, put water in them, get the fire going, and you go, you know? Try that with a mid-90s car with a computer, and you know, unless you've got that little relay box, or whatever, it's never gonna run again. Whereas this, it's, it's all just hand labor, isn't it? There are no tiny parts in this thing either. Not, not really, yeah. <laughs> all, all the parts you can see, I mean, look at the size of the wrenches you need for some of those right. nuts and bolts. But uh, for what it is, it's, it's actually quite delicate in that it runs like a Swiss watch. Right. And the seat of your pants finesse, I'm sure you experience that with your Doble or any of the other manual cars. 
This locomotive is, is a very fine running machine. And there's nothing like the power of steam. We know we're used to engines where you have to rev them up and you need a transmission to be able to move them because they don't have the power to move on their own, so they got to go through a series of gears. I always call this the hand of God. It's like this. You're just being pushed down the road. Yes. And this weighs, how much does it weigh? This is 600 tons, Jay. 600 tons. Yes. And it pulls away like nothing. Doesn't yes. It? It's equivalent to three of those locomotives you see back there. Right. So this represents the combined weight of three of those big modern, <laughs> we call it an SD70, three of those. And how much weight can this haul, can it pull? Not getting into the too much nuts and bolts, right. but they, they were said to pull a train five miles long on flat ground. Really? Five yes. miles long? Five miles long. So, that's the guy I'm always stuck behind. That's, yeah. that's right. <laughs> and in the, in the context of our, our traffic today, uh, we, we, run, we run a lot of traffic. That's efficient. The big boy was designed to haul, haul more cars to do the job more efficiently. Back before that, we had to use multiple locomotives. That process was called double heading. Right, the right. big boy solved the problem and eliminated the need for that second engine and all the associated costs with that. So the big boy was able to take more tonnage up the grade. You know, the fascinating, even if you know nothing about trains, just the magnificence of it, just the size of it. I mean, I imagine kids, little kids must go crazy when they see this. This is like meeting a dinosaur, isn't it? It's like it seeing, is. It's like seeing an actual dinosaur that goes down the road. And this is almost the equivalent in steam of, a, of Apollo 11, you know, because it used to take months to cross America. And then the railroads came in and it was due to a matter of weeks which must have just seemed like air travel when it first started to make. The fact you could go from New York to California in 14 days. Uh, it's unbelievable versus five or six months. You know? Yes, yeah. and, and risk your life in the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Union Pacific, aren't they, are they the, they're the ones that joined with the Golden Spike, if I remember my history, my fifth grade history, that connected the east and the west with rail for the first time that had been done, didn't it? That's correct. And it started right here in Council Bluffs. Oh, is that right? Abraham Lincoln was not very far from here when he gave the order to General Dodge. But it really was the equivalent of John F. Kennedy in 1961 saying, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of, oh, it'll never happen. And people didn't think that would ever happen back in the day. So Lincoln must have really been impressed. Show us a little bit more. These are the pistons here. Well, this, this is what we call a four-cylinder simple, meaning that right. the steam is used one time. So this design, this all represents one big casting you see here. Double acting cylinder here, what we call a piston valve. And you can see that casting right up there. Notice that it's all bare metal. That's because of the tremendous heat right here, yeah. of that superheated steam. Yeah. Very simple system. Looks complex, but here's your piston rod connected to the main rod and all the connecting rods, and that's what propels each engine. So this represents two steam locomotives under one big boiler. And it's amazing how powerful it is when you realize there's no transmission needed this, this, to generate the power. Like, like I said, with a car, the engine stand goes through a series of gears which, which step down to give you the power, whereas steam just moves you right from the get-go. You probably have 10,000 foot-pounds of torque from rest, something like that? Without running through all the math of this yeah. thing, the, the tractive force on this, it's a little bit different with a diesel. The tractive, the starting tractive effort is actually weak when you think about it. This produces its max power over 30 miles an hour, whereas a conventional locomotive, we get our money out of our locomotives at a slower speed. Right. They got their money out of this machine over roughly 25, 30, 35, 40 miles an hour, 7,000 horsepower, Jay. Now, on, on my steam vehicles, the steam cars I have, they have a thing called a hookup. The piston goes back and forth, and once you're rolling, you pull a lever, and it cuts the piston travel to save steam. Does this do that, too? Same thing. Same yep. thing. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. Yep. so this is just a giant version it is. of what I have, yep. which, is, which you, means we, I have to get one of these. We could show you a few things, and you could run it. Give me an idea how big this thing is. We're going to walk down to the cab. It shouldn't take us no longer than half an hour to get down here. This thing is huge, oh my God. But you just feel like a, a five-year-old kid. If you know anything about trains, you recognize this whole system here, the way it, it drives the wheels. Now, in a traditional locomotive, that'd be a Stevenson's link, but that's a little bit different, isn't it? Well, that's called the eccentric crank. That does control the valve gear. Right. Uh, see that little horizontal rod there? That's your, what's called a radius rod. Right. That controls forward and reverse, and everything is connected together. The valve events are fixed. 
and it, that you referenced the hooking up. Right. That's what you control. You control forward, reverse, and somewhat of a, not really infinite, but a really fine range of a control from when you start the locomotive to when you're, to when you're running at maximum speed. And it's the same forward or reverse. The engine doesn't care which direction. Right, the it runs. engine go back. It doesn't care. Because when you, it's almost like start stuff, start technology. When you stop, the engine stops. Not like a car. The engine doesn't keep running. That's the engine right. stops, and that goes the other way. When you go, want to go backwards, mm -hmm. and then you go forward. So what do we got? Is this a, a 488? 4884. Four, it is a 4884. Okay, tell us what that means. So we got four wheels in the front. That's right. called a lead truck or an engine truck. Now, don't, the, those don't drive, right? They don't, no. Right. They, they guide and lead this massive locomotive into curves and in and out of curves. The first set of eight drivers, this represents a single engine. It's also interesting to note that this represents our other locomotive, the 844. It has an 80 inch driver where these are 68. And then back here, you have an identical set another engine right behind us, right here. Right, so here's okay. the entire second engine. Right. So you've got the valves, the cylinder, an entire second engine right here. Same thing. And the interesting thing about this design, in order for the locomotive to work really efficiently, is they design both engines are identical. So as you open the throttle, the steam flow equal to both engines. So both engines are actually operating in sync. I call it the articulated effect. Right, okay. So even though one engine may slip and they will be out of sync, right. they will pretty quickly get right back in sync. Okay. And there's a really neat sound that the articulated locomotive makes. Okay. I'm a big sound effects person. Okay. Okay. So it's buff, 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 buff. But when it's operating, it sounds like a two cylinder instead of a four cylinder locomotive. Really a cool machine. Now, something I find fascinating, if you look at the brakes, they're the same idea of the brakes you'd have on your Schwinn bicycle. You pull a lever and it literally rubs against the tire. That's it. You know, you'd think in a, any kind of modern vehicle you'd have a brake hub or a disc brake. In, a, in, a, in an automobile, the, this would be asbestos or some brake material, but that's cast iron on, it's cast iron on steel and that must, that must glow red hot when, when you're hitting the brakes, doesn't it? It actually, it, the, the very edge of it will get hot and of course you smell that and that's part of the nuance of running a steam locomotive. You smell what we call our driver brakes. Right. There's oil and grease and it burns off, usually pretty quickly. But this whole locomotive is all by the seat of your pants. So you You're smell smelling it. it so when an engineer it. comes home, the way he goes, hey, you've been with an engine, haven't you? Yes, yes, <laughs> That's I right. have. That, they can tell. See, women yeah. know that stuff. When we're training a, a, a new engineer, we've been doing that here. Occasionally, the driver brakes will come on a little bit. And we just say driver brakes Yeah. because you can smell it. Right. The thing I find fascinating, if you ever built model train, had model trains when you were a kid. These are just big versions of the small pieces that you had. It's just so much fun to see them like this. I like this locking mechanism here that keeps the nut from, from loosening up. Serial number, is this the train serial number or is that just a part serial That's number? just a pattern number. Oh, okay. So this is part of the, the new material that we made when Union Pacific restored this locomotive in two and a half years. The original, 40, the, the, the 4014 that had been in service had over a million 30,000 miles on it. Right. So lots of worn out stuff. So this, this is new, called a crosshead guide. That nut is new, and there's just all parts of new material here, all forged, cast, machined, all custom. I recognize this red grease. Yes. Yeah, this is, I use this too. Mobile SHC 100. Yeah, yeah. Good yeah. stuff. Yeah, it does work good. Yeah. It does work good. But you can see the new casting here for the valve rod cross head, new pins, new bushings, cylinder liner, valve bushings, just like in an automobile, yeah. new rings, all custom. But unlike a modern automobile, there are no sealed bearings in this. You've got to lubricate all these by hand, don't you, pretty much? Actually, on this, it is equipped with giant Timken roller bearings on the axle. Okay. The actual crank pins and the rod brasses, I'll show you in a minute, those are bronze bushings, and they're greased manually about every 80 miles or so. And Timken is still making bearings. That's good to know. They do. Oh, that's yeah. good. You know, I love, it's all made in America. Mm. That's the great, you know, when I was a kid, my dad would say, uh, if you had a Packard, they'd say, we had parts made for this car as far away as Indiana. Wow, yeah. parts came from Indiana. That's yeah. unbelievable. All yeah. the way to Detroit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing here from overseas. You, you could build this in the United States without anybody else's help. And you would be impressed with how long it took them to build this. These were being assembled in what they called the erection shop at American Locomotive Company in Schenectady, New York. Yeah. And they were building these just right up to 
the, the, the time of the buildup of World War II. So there's photographs of these things coming together literally in a matter of weeks, right alongside Sherman tanks. When they built Willow Run, which was a Ford plant, which was converted to aircraft, and, and we were literally building planes faster than the Germans could shoot them down. Yeah. I mean, I don't even think we could do that today. Yeah. I almost think in a lot of ways, American manufacturing was more efficient 40, 50 years ago because everything was here. And of course, we couldn't have done it without the railroad. That's right. I mean, people don't realize, I don't know how much of a part railroads are in people's lives today. I don't think they realize that, how much this stuff is moved by train, moved by freight. I mean, when you have a piece like this, doesn't move on the back of a truck, you yeah. know. You might carry this piece or that arm or that lever, but you realize how much of America still goes by rail. It's just one of those things you just don't hear about anymore. That's part of the really interesting story about having a locomotive like this because it reminds people, because railroads really do, they're kind of operating in the background of our lives. You know, we, we'll, we'll hear that train horn in the middle of the night, or there'll be some you'll see a train operating under a bridge or an overpass but right. if you think about the volume of tonnage that this locomotive was designed to build and the volume of traffic back in the 1940s the railroads were very robust to handle the traffic that these locomotives were pulling look at the weight of this thing yeah the network that we have today i'm i'm happy to say i'm very privileged to be able to operate over just about all of it and i will tell you how rugged and robust it is i'm amazed at how thank you I'm amazed at how a, a simple rail like this can hold up that much weight. It almost seems like it would crack or bend or break or something. I mean, the weight of this, plus you're pulling thousands of tons. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. How much of this is original in the sense that all you had to do was clean it up? Did the whole thing have to be completely torn down or were some parts still robust enough that we could clean up this wheel and that'll be fine, you know what I mean? Well, we, we took it completely apart. Right. So if you were to look at this, if uh, a, a, a kind of a train buff like me, I have what's called the locomotive encyclopedia. And when you look at that, it shows the construction pictures of when they made these things and what all the parts look like on the factory floor. Well, if you were in Cheyenne in 2017, 2018, you would see those parts. Yeah. We took it apart, we disassembled the front engine this, took the jacket off, took the boiler apart, all the wheels out of it, and we sandblasted everything and cleaned it, put it all back together again. Uh -huh. So new parts to old parts. I need to sit down and tally that up, but I bet you we're, we're at 60% new parts on all the running equipment. Yeah. You know, the rods and the big heavy duty right. stuff. You saw that cross that I mentioned there. You know, the cylinder, just like in an automobile, there's a liner in there. That's all new on this side, all the valve bushings. I mean, I could just go down the list and just name all the parts because I'm, our fingerprints are all over this. I'm amazed that the technology still exists to make the parts. You know, I, I have some old airplane engines and I couldn't find anybody to make a crankshaft for V12 Merlin because all of the tooling got sent to India or China or overseas. Somebody bought it all, you know? And it, so I wonder if you had that problem with this. Well, that was my job and, and there were a few parts that took me about a year's worth of emailing and sometimes I would go visit a factory or a manufacturing plant they had the ability to do it, but they just didn't know if they really needed to, even yeah. though we, we only wanted like 12 parts or whatever it was. So, but we were able to get everything forged, everything cast. Uh, we draw it in CAD, we take the old blueprints. We have most all of the blueprints in 1975. This is a cool story. The Union Pacific took all their steam locomotive stuff and rather than throwing it away, yeah. they microfilmed it oh, and set great. it aside. And in the 1990s, the Historical Society went through and they scanned everything and they sell them online. Anybody can buy a big boy set of drawings. Oh, that's a great well, thing, the foresight to do that. So we have all that stuff and we convert those into modern CAD files and that's how you communicate to modern industry and you can make castings, CNC shops can make parts for you and that's what we did. We made everything. Well, let's, let's, let's continue our walk down to get to the cabin here. We should be there in about another 20 minutes. This is the boiler right here, correct? This is the firebox and combustion chamber. And the neat thing about this, that the crown sheet on this, on this firebox is 29 feet long, and the distance over tube sheets, for those people who are into the technical side, is 22 feet. So this entire, pretty much everything that you see here from the gray section that's called the smoke box, this is all boiler firebox. Well, let's explain what the crown sheet is. The, crown, the fire is below the crown sheet, and then the water is on top of the crown sheet. As long as you have water over the crown sheet, you'll be fine. 
But if that ever gets below it, either run away or that's why I... You may not be able to run fast enough. Well, you know, I converted my to run on propane, so I can shut the fire off right now. You know, you got coal or wood or something, run away because <laughs> it's going to blow. Just get out of there. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it's kind of the, the fundamentals of steam locomotives that the water level management is very carefully monitored. Right. Good qualified guys. There's just a handful of us on this locomotive. We're training a few more. But here on this, this boiler here, this is called the side sheet. So there's actually a water space, and you see all those little button ends, those are called stay bolts. Yeah. And they secure that inner yeah. sheet, which transitions up to that, that crown sheet that you mentioned. And people don't realize how powerful steam is. I, I've got a, a 1906 advanced tractor, and that beat a guy that had a twin engine, diesel, turbocharged, the whole, the whole thing, and dragged it backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was steam. Effortlessly, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, very good. Let's see what else we got here. Let's so you can it. hear the oil fire in there. Yeah. You can hear that. So originally, these were built to burn coal. That's why this, the whole underside here is very large. That was all grade area, 150 square feet for that coal fire. When we, we restored this, we had no intention of running coal, right. converted to burn oil. A very simple system. You can hear that atomizer and kind of hear that oil gurgling around in there. And you hear that, that combustion air just flowing in naturally, drawn in through the natural process of this thing running. And how often do you have to drain the firebox, to clean the firebox? Not so much with oil, I guess. O only once. We have an in inspection period, 31 service days. We go through an annual maintenance process, but it is very clean compared to coal. Yeah, yeah. Burning coal, you, you have literally tons of ash oh, yeah. daily to contend with. Yeah. OK, well, here we are at the end. Now, this, this is your. Uh, uh, tender fuel. right here, correct? Yes. It's got your water or is it water or coal or, or, or oil in here. What is here? There's two compartments. If you look up here, right in the middle of that word union, you see a diagonal rivet line. Yeah. That was what's called a slope sheet for the coal to naturally flow down into a stoker mechanism. Right. Okay. And that's what delivered the coal. Well, there's a fuel tank placed in that coal space. And around it, like a big horseshoe, is your water. So there's 25,000 gallons of water here. And because we no longer have all the water logistics that went away years ago with the steam locomotive, we have two cars behind this that are just water. So with all that fuel and water, you know, we're good for about 250 miles. Now, you don't need like Evian racing water. You just use regular. We would love Evian racing water, but we just can't find 50,000 gallons oh, and of And open it all day. those little bottles. Oh, oh mm. they feed it all day. Yeah. Any significance to 4014, or that's just the number that in the build cycle, or? Does well, it signify anything? A, a little bit of a story there. So there were 25 of these. This, uh, this was the first group of 20. The 4014 was donated in 1961 to the Los Angeles County Fairground, the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society, a museum still running called Rail Giants. Great right. place. Big locomotives out there. This locomotive, when the decision was made to restore a uh, big boy, I had been out and I looked at this locomotive. And I can't really remember all the details, but I had heard through the grapevine that they wanted this thing to run again. And so it was in Los Angeles. It's, it's sunny out there. Right. It's not very wet. And they had taken pretty good care of it. So it wasn't deteriorated like a lot of locomotives that sit in a park and they're out in the weather all the time. Right. So from, from the moment, it was my, my decision, my choice to pick, and I wanted the 4014. And we towed it home, rebuilt it to an half year. Wait, wait, how do you tow this home? I mean, obviously, you don't, you don't have a Ford F-150. How do you tow this thing home? Well, we're a railroad, and we can do just about anything That's you right. need. That's right. We're a railroad. That's we right. do anything we want. That's right. That's right, mister. So we, had, we have another locomotive that was numbered the 4014. Right. Here in a minute, you can go back. That's the 4015. So we had the 4014 diesel, and this is a 4884. And we had another engine that was numbered 4884. Okay. And we did some prep work of several months. We were tinkering with everything, getting it all lubed up, getting it greased up, did some federal paperwork, and we literally towed it all the way from Los Angeles back to Cheyenne. Now, here's a dumb question. Did you pull it on tracks with the wheels turning, or did you, did you get it up on it? You don't get it up. How do you, how do you tow? Are you pulling it on tracks? Or? Yeah, absolutely. We leapfrogged it out of there. So it was a mile away from where we needed it to be. Right. So my team and I, we built a giant model railroad. Our colleagues in California gave me 26 pieces of 40-foot track panels 
we rented big forklifts and we literally just built the track and moved it, curved it, moved it. We moved it a mile in seven days. Wow. And then coordinated with everybody, had excellent collaboration. I mean, it's some of the funnest stuff we've done. I like this. One night on the Tonight Show, we had an elephant on. Uh. In the middle of the show, the elephant was backstage and pee, <laughs> 55 gallons. I mean, we had guys that squeaked the whole place. It was, it was, that's what just reminded me of. Just yeah. Suddenly, what's that? It's, I thought a, a pipe had burst. It just flooded the whole place. Yeah. So in a nutshell, how'd the number get there? Okay, so these were built number 4,000 to number 4,024. Right. This one was one of those 25 locomotives. It was going to be scrapped. And the organization asked the Union Pacific to donate it. So they donated it out there. So here's the 4014 sitting out there, forlorn, being taken care of nicely in the museum. We asked to return this locomotive. They gave it back to us so we could restore it. So this is 4014 out of 25. Wow. Okay. There happens to be eight of them in existence. This is the only one running. Now tell us about the origin name Big Boy, because I think of a kid holding a hamburger out front of a restaurant. Where did it come from? When these locomotives were being assembled at American Locomotive Company, in this case it would have been uh, mid-1941, an anonymous employee went out as this locomotive, the very first one. It wasn't this one, it was the number 4000, and they rolled it out the door and they were just testing them. Somebody went up there and they took a piece of chalk and they wrote the words Big Boy with a V for victory on the smoke box. Somebody snapped a picture of it, that really took hold. Yeah. And throughout that entire period of that, all the effort building up to the war, and then the history of these locomotives, that became the story of the big boy. And occasionally we'll put that chalk riding on the smoke box to commemorate what the big boy locomotive represents to America. Can we take a look in the cabin? Absolutely. Okay. Want to follow me up? All right, go ahead. We'll just climb right up here, 1940 style. Here you go, Jay. All right. Welcome to the cab of the big boy, Jay. Oh, it's great. Jay, hey. I'd like you to meet Ted Schulte. Ted, how are you, Ted? sir? Nice to Good meet you. you. Yeah, those are the same water valves I have on my Stanley. Actually, the same, yeah, the same ones, actually. Yeah. That's your water level, right? That's, That's right. On the boiler this large, you need two. Right. Because of the, the length of the locomotive, uphill and down, the water level varies. Right. And they help you maintain the proper water level. And I assume this is danger right below there. Uh, those are just kind of some, some key lines. Uh, we're, we're working on training some firemen, so we're just kind of giving to them some visual cues. Uh, danger is actually down in here. Oh, okay. So at, at no time will water ever be out of this bottom glass. Because I can understand that when it gets down, you turn on the you turn on the pumps, and as you're you know, you watch the level rise, and when it gets above half, you can shut it off again. On a steam locomotive, it, it's a little bit different. So we're maintaining what we call the evaporative rate, the rate at which the locomotive is boiling water, producing right. its power. So we're we're replacing that water at the same rate and the same interval, if you will, that we're consuming it. We've got an injector here, that exhaust steam injector and a big live steam injector here, and it uses the live steam or the exhaust steam and a combination of live steam to put that water in the boiler, just, just like a pump on your car. Yeah, See, this, I guess this is meant to run at a, at a constant rate of fuel use. In a car, you stop at a light, yeah. oh, you know, oh, and then you, yeah, so you're, you're constant. That's why the Dobo has that draft booster. Yeah. Okay, oh, very cool. You still do it, but you do it much more controlled and you plan ahead a lot. You know, we'll run up and stop and we tone everything back. This is called a spot fire right here. Right. When we're underway, you know, we're generating greater horsepower, therefore this fire is really ripping and roaring along. Yeah. That's the gates of hell, Lodge. Any reason why these gauges are like this style and those gauges are that style? Is so these are actually a more modern style of valve. So these are a forged steel valve, right. modern, available, properly engineered for the steam pressure. Most of the valves on the locomotive, you know, they were period valves from the 40s. They're heavy duty, they're rugged, yeah. but they also are 80 years older right. and older. See, I like these because you've got these little nubs here. That yeah. I, I always had trouble with those when they, because, yeah, I have to put a wrench on. You get oil and grease on your hands. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. And over here we have the engineer, and we have what's called PTC, positive train control. Right. And when the PTC system is on and active. Oh, this is that new fancy electronic stuff. That's right. Yeah. kids today, they don't know what they're doing. That. 
So we have this system and it has a series of heavy duty computers, GPS antennas, and it interfaces with the whole other world out there. And it provides a layer of really good effective control. Well, I mean, I think it's just great. I love the fact that Union Pacific just treasures its history, you know? You look back, because so many people, you move on to the next thing, you throw it away, you throw it away. It, it's so nice to save something like this. And like you said, kids go nuts when they see it, because it's like a dinosaur. It's big, you know, they want to have a model of it, they want to ride in it. Oh, it's great. Yeah, there's the 10-year-old the kids, the 30, 40, 50, 80-year-old kids. They, yeah, yeah. They just love it. There's a few modern things we have, a, a spinometer. This right. spinometer is actually 40 years old, but right. it's modern. And this electronic device monitors the air pressure at the end of the train. And then we have a 12-volt vehicle radio right up here. Other than that, all of this locomotive is all original 1940s. Yeah. Of course, we converted it to burn oil, so it looked different than it did when it used to burn coal. But this is all very simple, very basic technology. And you even carry the sand in case of fire? Well, the sand is used to sand out the flues. So when you burn oil, over time, there's just a little bit of byproducts of the combustion. It's oh. kind of like a little fine layer right. that attaches to the metal in there. Right, right. And when we're working hard enough, we can take a scoop of that and we pour it right into the sand hole and it sucks it in there and it kind of it bounces around. It blasts it out. It yeah. does. And yeah. you get a little plume of soot following the train. Oh. That's right. that. Ted likes the sand the flues. And are these pop-offs? What are those? Are those? those are called washout plugs. Okay. And uh, we, we have a lot of questions about these because these are actually dog dishes that we get at the, the pet store. So that's a stainless steel dog dish yeah. with the bottom cut out of it. It makes a really nice thimble. But there's those washout plugs throughout the, this is called the back head. Right. And you can see them along the, the, the side of the boiler called the combustion chamber. So when you're outside, you can look at those stainless steel dog dishes. But that's what we take out when we wash the boiler and go through our, our annual maintenance. How many miles a year do you think you put on this? On um, this year, we'll be just under 7,000. When we're done with this year, we'll have just under 21,000 miles on the locomotive since we restored oh, it in great. 2019. And you still go to the national parks and do all of that? Well, we, we, we go wherever they tell us. Yeah. And the, the, the fun part of our job is that we have a job where we never say no. Right, right. When they want the locomotive, our job is to figure out how we get it there. We work with hundreds, thousands of our colleagues to make this thing happen. And do you have to replace track because this thing is so big and so heavy? Or no. the tracks, they still take it, huh? Oh, the track is very robust. If you yeah. think about when the steam locomotives were roaming the earth, the track structure was very strong, very strong. By today's standards, our track structure, which you'll see if you just look right over my shoulder there, we're talking about a rugged, heavy-duty network. And the tonnages that we carry on our railroads today, the weight per car is up but the weight per axle is pretty comparable. Like this locomotive, the actual weight on each axle is just slightly under what the weight of the, the axles on the locomotive are. So pound for pound, it's essentially the same railroad. A lot more stuff moves by rail than people think, don't they? they Absolutely. You know, as they're trucking, it, it's not. I mean, rail is as probably as big as it ever was, isn't it? If you take, say, an average load of lumber, yeah. that's four to five trucks, you know, uh, one truck on the road, a big heavy-duty truck, is 25 tons of gravel or asphalt or some other commodity. One rail car is 130 tons. Yeah. And when you've got 200 rail cars, you think of the equivalent amount of trucks. Wow. A lot of the uh, other traffics, you know, you'll see trains running out here with all those containers. Just think each one of those containers represents a single load of truck. And you've got three, 400 of them on one train. So it's safe to say your job is safe. Yes. You want to sit in the engineer seat, Jay? Yeah, let me sit in the engineer seat. See, here's what I love about a steam car. It's like a hundred and something degrees in here. I stick my head out the window. Oh, I get a chill. Even though it's, it's 80 out there, but I feel like I'm freezing because you get so used to the heat. And how many gallons of water does it hold? In the boiler, there's, there's over 11,000 gallons of water <laughs> in the boiler. When we're operating down the track, it's around the range of 9,500 or so. Now, is, is this... Boiler ever? It's all. I guess it's cold when you shut it down. But does is it ever totally shut down? Like in the summer, is there always heat in the boiler? When we leave on a trip, we steam it up a few days before we leave. Right. And there's there's certain technical reasons on on what we call our service days. Right. But every day we're on the road until we get down to Texas. We're going to do some maintenance down there. We have a fire in the boiler when we're operating. 
when we're done at night, here in about 20 minutes, we're gonna shut that fire off and we close all of the air surfaces off and this thing will retain heat really good. We'll come back in the morning about five, six a.m. It'll still have 200 pounds of pressure on it. The water will distill up in that top class. Yeah, that's we light the fire and away we go. That's the same thing with my doble. Yeah. So from dead cold, you haven't run it for six months. How long does it take to fire up? We take about four days. Four days? Yep. Back in the days when so they ran So if your wife's these pregnant, things, you don't want to get to no, the hospital. No, don't, 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 don't steam up your steam engine. Yeah, yeah. But we, we take we take care of it. It's, it's it's our baby. You know, there's certain process we go through. We, we let this giant boiler think, you know, you got to realize this thing expands an inch from where it is cold to right. hot. So we do that nice and even. We control all that stuff. And you're heating up 11,000 gallons, yep. 11, gallons of water from cold, correct? Yep. Now, do you heat it up? Full high pressure on the boiler, no. or, or do you heat it gradually? Gradually, we yeah. have a, a, a plant that heats up about 280 degree water, okay. and we flow that water in here for a couple I of see. days. It fills it up with that really hot water. And then we've got an external steam plant. We jam that on there. We jack her up to about 50 pounds of pressure. We light her up. We're up and running. So you can't shock it. No. no. I mean, in the old days, this thing isn't an old little fragile Christmas ornament. Right. Where it's right. Going to break. But we're just we're diligent. We're careful. Yeah, it's we still hundred year old. Yeah. yeah. It's really rugged, really solid. We test it, it can take it, but we're really careful with it. And what is this here? That's your throttle. Oh, that's throttle. That's 7,000 horsepower. Reach up and grab 7,000 horsepower. There you go, there you Just are. Just don't pull it back too far. Right. Yeah. Very nice. And here's your forward and reverse here. Right. That's your brake for the locomotive. And we've got a few other little custom gadgets that we've added to it that it had during the steam days, but we've modified it so we can control those while we're actually underway. And this is your cylinder drain right here. That's so, right, okay. yep. Yeah, if yeah. you want to, go ahead and rotate that to the right. Well, you open it. There you go. you got to crank it hard. Spin it, spin it hard all the way around. There you go. Now they're closed. And now fling it really quick with your wrist and fling it all the way the other way counterclockwise. Yeah, that, yeah that's just yep. like the double of the steam. Uh -huh. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, steam technology is, is fascinating. And you know, it's funny because people think it's such a mystery, but in 1940, more guys knew about steam than knew about internal combustion, yeah. especially the older guys, because that's what they grew up with. Every, you had steam ships. Uh, Bessel even built a steam airplane. Did you ever see that? Mm. Yeah, Google that, Bessel steam mm. airplane. And they built it to be a spy plane because it, it didn't make any noise at all. It could mm. fly over. All you heard was a just the propeller going on. Yeah, back when these locomotives were in regular service, you know, thousands of people operated these, just like our trains today. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's very specialized today. There's a lot of really good qualified steam locomotive people, but it's uh, this technology. It's uh, you know, you've got the heat, uh, the work. I mean, you you get dirty. You know, it's just the nature of it. And there's a long apprenticeship when you serve in a job like this. Yeah. You just don't jump up here and start running it. Well, I love the fact you realize it only takes one or two generations for technology to just disappear. And then and the fact that you guys and, and Union Pacific is keeping it going, I really think it's terrific. You know, there's a wonderful college, McPherson College. They do a whole four-year course in automobile restoration, steam cars, old electric cars, everything, you know. And they have apprentices, and I bet some of their apprentices would love to work with you on this. Yeah. It's nice to get the next generation involved. Yeah, that's what we have. We've got we've got uh, a younger generation that's uh, getting ready to take over the ropes and a lot of different parts of the locomotive, uh, the maintenance of it, operation, firing. But that's part of that apprenticeship we talked about because you can read a lot of books about all of the different nuance, but it's all the 1940s. Right. You know, it's but it's. Uh, as complicated as this looks, it's a simple machine, but it's seat of the pants, run it by your wristwatch, control it with your hands. You know, it's funny, I've got a 1915 Hispano Suiza airplane engine in a car, and I've got the manual. In the manual, most men were illiterate. Mm. So the manual was just guys with work shirts and ties. Everything was a picture. It's all pictures of how to how to put the bear, because I know this, you, you, you drop the oil pan, the bearings are in the pan, take the bearings out, put new bearings, then slap them on, send it back up in the air again, you know? Yeah. And it's a fascinating because you realize they couldn't read, but they could understand the pictures, and he just showed you how to rebuild the whole engine just through pictures. It's yeah. really, really kind of neat. 
there's a fascinating story of the development of all this this technology and many of the the, the people that grew up and went through, they ultimately did go to college, but many of them came from a pretty humble beginning, started out as a laborer, started out in a position in the shop, and they worked their way up. The story of those the actual that designed this locomotive, that's that story. You know, when I was a kid, I was six years old, and somebody gave me a book, Mike Mulligan and the Steam yeah, Shovel. Yeah. Remember that book? Oh, absolutely. Well, Where I got it gets that in the book. basement and, and you got to leave it there? Yeah, and yeah. The, uh, the, the family next door to us, the Volans, they had the coal man come every month with a chute and he would shoot coal into their basement. And I would go sit and I'd sit on the pile of coal and read Mike Mulligan's yeah. steam show. So that's how I kind of got yeah. into it. We're going to go for a ride tomorrow, Jake, tomorrow morning. But first, I'd like to, uh, we'd like to take you in and show you where we maintain the passenger cars. So we have restored a fleet of 1940s, 1950s, what we call streamliner cars. You can see some of them that we're coupled to right now. We'd like to take you in and show you the Heritage Fleet Shop. Let's do it. Well, Jay, it was great visiting with you. I've got to go get the big boy ready. All right, Ed, thank you very much. You're very thank welcome. You. My two colleagues, Bill Goobles, Amy Colling. Bill, how are you, Amy? Nice Hi, you guys. Hi, Jay. Wow, this is a nice setup. This is where all the Heritage Fleet is stored. This is where majority of the work is done on the fleet. The ready track, which is outside, trains go out, come back into the building here. This is where we do all of our mid-year inspections our quarterly inspections, our outbounds, inbounds, most of that work's all done in here prior to train going back out on the ready track, which it departs from there. And what vintage are most of these cars in here? Most of these cars are from the 50s. Oh, okay. uh, they'll range from 49, there are some 49 built cars in this mix, up to 65 right. actually would be the newest car in here. Oh, okay. But they'll range mostly 50s vintage. Okay. So you keep updating them or you try to keep the vintage look or how does that work? We do, but it's very difficult sometimes to hide the technology. You want that, that vintage feel. You want right. to make it feel like you step back in time when you first walk into it. So it's very hard sometimes to hide the technology. Yeah, but you don't want those hot embers hitting your clothes. You know, right. yeah, 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 try to avoid that part. That's true. Yeah, we yeah, don't yeah. want that. Yeah, you don't want that. Well, very good. Can we take a look at some of the cars? Sure. Absolutely. This way. Just watch your step on this rail. Okay. Make sure you step over it, please. This is the first one? This is the first one. This is the Green River. This is the St. Louis car. This is one of our high-end business cars. So wow. Kitchen area here. Yeah. Full this kitchen. Would, this would be considered the crew quarters for the crew. Right. And then we're walking into the dining area slash meeting area. Oh, where look they at have this. Their yeah. conference meetings, dining area. Oh, this is great. Yeah, it's a nice way to travel. It's beautiful. We try to hide technology when we're in these cars, so we, we have little cubbies and secret hidden oh, look at, ooh, ooh, things fancy. everywhere. Very nice. Bill, if you could hit the button under the, Is the TV table for the TV that's hidden behind oh, the Oh, very cool, look at that. So this is a car that we would normally uh, use for high end. Uh, so yeah. our CEO will ride in this car yeah, during the nice travels. Travel. And we'll walk down the hallway over here. This here's a, a bathroom, right? public bathroom, so it's not connected to any bedroom or anything. And then there is an office, another bathroom and shower, and the bedroom. Oh, and this is the sitting area? And this is the observation room. Oh, this is great, wow. Well, it's a nice way to travel, you know, be it. Yes, very much so. Oh, yeah. Beat Southwest. <laughs> yeah, sit, down. sit down. Rough. Take a load off, sit down, relax, get ready for your trip tomorrow. Yeah, when I drive to yeah. tomorrow, I'll just camp out here. <laughs> You know, it's kind of interesting to travel in a car where you have more room than you could possibly use. We're all used to cramped airplanes. You go, why would anyone take a train anywhere? It takes so long. But then you get inside one of these and realize it's like your house. It's like you're driving in your house. You got all kinds of room. You can stretch out. They got pretty good bacon, too. Come on. Please, thank you. Please keep the noise down. Thank you, folks.
as you can see, my, my crowd's not as big as Roosevelt and some of those guys. They're, they're probably stuck in traffic. That's why there's nobody here. Thank you all for coming. But right now, hey, let's take a look at the inside of the train and we'll go up and uh, we'll show you how we operate the train too. I'm, I'm gonna sit in the engineer's booth. Liam Neeson with a gun going through here. Kind of expect to run into President Garfield in here. Well, how cool is this? This is the dome or the observation deck. I never thought I'd enjoy going 40 miles an hour. You see the engine enveloped in steam up there. I don't know idea how many hundreds of tons this thing is pulling away with, but it's got to be. It's got to be a lot. Now you see that black smoke, that means the engines run a little rich. They're using more fuel. As soon as that black smoke disappears, that's when the engine is running at optimum efficiency. It's like a moving neighborhood, you know? It's like all the houses on your street are going down the street at the same time. This is a pretty luxurious way to travel back in the early 1900s or even late 1800s. This is what rich people did instead of having a limo or a Bugatti or a Ferrari or some kind of fancy car. You got your own rail car and you've outfitted it the way you want it. Now you see a slight bend in the track up there. This engine is like 132 feet long, so it needs to articulate, which means it needs to, to move when it goes around the corners. Even, even a big sweeping corner, you're still, you know, you, you still got a little bit of movement there. As you can see, the black smoke is dissipating, and the smoke, white smoke is becoming clear. And pretty soon, that'll be pretty much gone altogether. And the rest is just steam. The train is still accelerating, so that I think you're giving it a little bit more throttle than is necessary, and that's why you get that heavy black smoke. You know, back in the day, how you got there was almost as important as where you were going because the it was an adventure, it was comfortable. You know, even air travel, the dirigibles that were crossing the Atlantic before airplanes, uh, they were like this. They were big, comfortable. They had a dining car, they had a sleeping car. You know, now you're trying to sleep on an airplane. Thank you. You know, it's interesting. This train is on this, on this route all the time, yet the same people come out every day just to see it go by. It's just such an amazing sight to see something huge. They call this the heartland of America. Or it, the home base is in Cheyenne, Wyoming. We're in Council Bluffs now. And, uh, well, we're going through the heartland of America. In this tour, they're trying to go through 10 states. Now, see, if you're in a plane, you can do it in an hour and a half. But then you wouldn't see anything. But it really is leisure travel. You know, you don't... You don't really travel leisurely anymore. You just sort of get to the place and it's annoying and you're on the plane and the guy in front of you is kicking the back of your seat, the guy in back of you is kicking the back of your seat, whatever it might be. This is leisurely. Look at that, all the room you have. And it, it's incredible. I mean, you can see the, the train articulating here. I mean, notice the, the cars are going like this. As you can see, the walls are festooned with period pictures, 30s, 40s, 1950s. There's a whistle stop guy right there. Who is that, is that? Is that Nixon? I can't think. Come on, let's take a look at the dining car. It has Star Trek doors that go Good. All right. 
this is the way to travel. I'll show you one in the bedroom. Boy, this is pretty cool. Missouri Valley, Iowa. Well, I got my safety glasses. Got to put the air protection on. Here's Ed. Hey, good morning, Jay. Ready to go for a ride? Yeah, ready to go. Let's give it a shot. Let's go. All right. After you. Thanks. Pressure 59. Howdy, boys. Howdy, Mr. Jay. How nice you doing, sir? That. Gentlemen, hello again. Thousand revolutions. This is in the hundreds, right? How many, how many revolutions per mile did you get on the engine? 296. 296 revolutions per mile, which is pretty amazing. Shows you how much power it has. And you can hear a, a conventional four cylinder one, two, three, four. This yeah. is two. They're syncopated, they get inside. Yeah. No electric watches on a train. What are you doing, about 40 miles an hour, 35? 34. 34 miles an hour. Let's think of a perfect day. I always know that old song, you can hear the whistle blow 100 miles. Oh yeah, you can hear this for probably at least four or five miles. Just four or five miles. miles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. At the whistle, it's, it's, it's probably pushing 700 degrees yeah. at 300 pounds. I get the feeling this is what Ed would be doing when he wasn't working. This is what he does on his day off, too. This what is the throttle? Is it a needle valve? No, it's a series of big, like a poppet valve. Poppet valve? A giant, just they look just like a big intake or exhaust valve, but they're that big around. Right. And they're forged. We had them all custom machined. We made them. They slammed down, yeah. And you're working against that 300 pounds yeah. of pressure. So you got to really... You have to hand lap them in? Yes. Yep. He and I take them out and we put them in every time we run the locomotive. So oh, is that right? Yeah. We take them out, we put them in a box in my office, and then we take care of it. This throttle, when we do our inspections, there's not even a drop of water. You probably yeah. noticed that when we're sitting there. The cylinder cocks are not dropping anything. And what do you make them out of? 86. 8630 vanadium modified steel. Oh, steel, right. Yep. We're, gonna another, we're going to let another train around us, right. but we don't delay him, so we're going to slow down and just kind of let him yeah. do his thing. As long as he doesn't try to pass us. No. We usually pass other trains. Now, that is a cool experience. You've got two railroads, two tracks, in some cases three. Right. And we can actually pass other trains. We'll be doing 45 or 50, they're doing 30, 40. Yeah. You know, it takes miles to get past them. It's quite the experience. I'm surprised you don't have different whistles, different pitches. You can control that. But no real high pitch. No. I know in my uh, advanced tractor, I got three different whistles. Mm -hmm. Really high, medium, and a low whistle. Mm -hmm. When we get to a road crossing, by regulation, we blow two longs, a short and a long, you'll hear that. Yeah. And we blow the whistle so frequently that, you know, you just 
rather than just blow it in some mundane fashion, yeah. there is an artistic nuance that, that yeah. anyone who's been around a locomotive for a while, it's and, a matter of pride. And this is a curve where the train is articulating, isn't it? Yes. Right here. You can see it a little bit. Watch your ears, everybody. Federal Railroad Administration Class 3. I also have another gentleman that I'm training, Kurt. And Jimmy, who is up here. Jimmy was the fireman from Council Bluffs to Missouri Valley. I've got another young man that I'm training as a fireman as well. trouble with our electronic computer. You know, Sherlock Holmes said, electricity is a high priestess of false security. Is it just a matter of shutting it off and rebooting? More or less. Yeah. Okay. I was just had to fix a minor problem and I'm on our way again. A problem of modern electronics, nothing to do with steam. Hi, you guys. Hi, folks. You know, with the exception of the modern cars, I don't imagine the scenery in this route has changed much in the last hundred years. Pretty much just cornfield. You know, it really wasn't until the 19th century that people went, much, went any faster than a horse could ride. Imagine riding a horse and then getting a chance to ride this thing, and you're pulling 600 tons. <laughs> All right, are you ready to blow the whistle, Jay? You want to blow the whistle, are yeah. Are you ready to do a Casey Jones? Better than I can Oh, great. Thanks a lot, boy. It's really exciting. Once in a lifetime thing. I, I, I mean, I've read about this thing my whole life, so it's really cool to be able to get a chance to ride on it. And then the fact that you keep it going for the next generation, the one after that. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, we're very, we're very privileged that, uh, that we do this and, and uh, UP stand behind us. You know, we've been doing uh, this particular project yeah. for over a decade. Did you get to meet a lot of the old guys that 
maybe re when this thing retired in the 50s, did any of them get to see it run again? Only a few. Yeah. Yeah, and they were in their 90s then. Yeah, yeah, so, but they got to see it together. Yeah, they again. did. Yeah. yeah, there were two when we had this on its inaugural run yeah. for the 150th anniversary of the drive in the Golden Spike. There were two gentlemen there wow. that actually worked on it in the 50s as firemen. You know, they're yeah. in their 20s then. Yeah, that's so, great. Oh, yeah. Well, Ed, yeah. thanks a lot, my yes, friend. Yes, sir. Thank Come you, out Jake. to California. We'll take you out in the dope. Oh, we'd love it. Yeah, yeah, we'd love it. A lot of people want to meet movie stars or athletes. Today, I got to meet one of my heroes, the big boy. Pretty exciting. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Got to watch it pull away. And you know who really loves this? The neighbors. Bye guys, thanks for everything. The hobos are getting a lot better looking. <laughs>